the movie, and um, Marcel did his thesis with Steve, and then moved again here to Stanford to do a postdoc, uh, working, continuing to work with Steve. So thank you. Is the mic on? <laughs> I think I turned it on. Yeah, it's on. It's on. <coughs> Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. <coughs> um, so I'm also one of those people who uh, migrated from X-ray astronomy um, to cosmology and now on to transients, which is, uh, to me, cosmology and transients is the same thing. It's the same kind of data. Um, I, I got involved in this um, only because I came to Stanford working uh, with Steve and Roger Blanford and uh, also Roger Romani. I don't see Roger uh, Romani. Oh, Roger, hey, good to see you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and they got me uh, involved in the uh, SDSS-2 supernova survey, which was the precursor to the dark energy survey, uh, which is the, uh, the current um, ongoing uh, wide area uh, survey that I'll be spending uh, most of my uh, time on. <clears throat> uh, this is an actual picture uh, from the dark energy survey. One of these hexagons uh, corresponds to the focal plane of the dark energy uh, camera. It has 62 uh, CCDs, an area of about three square degrees. Uh, there are a total of one and a half billion pixels uh, in this. And this is one uh, visit of uh, an exposure that we took of a supernova field in which we're trying to find a high redshift type 1a supernovae as well as other uh, transients. I'll be spending uh, most of my uh, time on that. <clears throat> um, since I think not everyone here is a cosmologist, so let me uh, briefly describe uh, what supernova cosmology is, what kinds of measurements we make, and how we use those measurements to, uh, to understand dark energy. <clears throat> uh, so to first order, this is a very simple uh, thing that we do. Uh, we try to uh, measure the uh, expansion history of the universe by looking at the, the past. So the time axis uh, is uh, here, future is, uh, uh, is up, past is down. Of course, we can't see in the future, but we can see uh, in the past. And imagine the horizontal uh, axis to be sort of the scale of the universe. <clears throat> um, if you look at this uh, hypothetical uh, universe in which uh, some big explosion occurred many, many year, uh, years ago, the universe uh, expanded, but it's slowing down because there's stuff in the universe, gravity in the universe, that tries to bring uh, matter uh, back together because of the gravitational uh, attraction. And you can see uh, in this universe, the universe expanded, but the expansion of the universe is slowing down. <clears throat> um, you can sort of think of this universe as throwing a ball up, and if the uh, speed of the ball is less than the escape speed of the, uh, say, from the uh, surface of uh, Earth, it will come down. And if you have a lot of uh, matter in your universe, it will expand, but eventually recollapse. <clears throat> um, if you take a, a faster uh, universe, uh, that looks like this. You can have a universe that's expanding, it's slowing down, but it's never going to slow down to the point where the universe would recollapse. Uh, something like this might happen if the uh, density, the uh, mass density of the universe is not as high uh, as this. Um, and so uh, the um, freshman physics analog of this universe is you're throwing the ball upward at, uh, at the, just at the escape speed, so it barely escapes out into infinity. Um, if, you have, if you throw a ball at a speed that's much, much larger than the, uh, the gravitational um, escape speed, you can have a constant speed uh, ball and also a constant uh, uh, speed universe. <clears throat> so uh, people in the 1990s uh, were trying to, uh, to distinguish which one of these or where are universes along this uh, spectrum here. Uh, there are two critical measurements that you have to do in order to make this, um, <clears throat> uh, this to work. Uh, you need to be able to measure the distance to some past in the universe, uh, which is not very easy to do, and then also measure the size of that universe back then. The relation between the distance and the redshift tells you the expansion history of the universe, and that is sensitive to the, uh, the dark matter uh, density. Redshift, as everyone knows, is easy to measure. Distance is not uh, so trivial. And a supernovae, type 1a supernovae, is one of the tools that you can use in order to measure the distance to, uh, to uh, some old universe. Um, the graphical representation of that is uh, what's called a Hubble diagram. 
you plot the uh, redshift, and this is the scale of the universe, and the uh, distance how far, far away that particular uh, universe was, and this relation tells you how much uh, matter there is, how much dark energy uh, there is, and so forth. Um, if you have a universe that only has matter, then uh, you can quantify that expansion rate in terms of what's called a deceleration parameter. Uh, if the deceleration parameter is positive, that means the universe decelerates, which is what was expected in the 1990s. But when uh, people made the measurement, what they found was that instead of the universe decelerating, the expansion was, uh, is accelerating. <clears throat> and it's something that you cannot do with gravity alone. Obviously, if I take this, uh, this clicker and throw it up, uh, if, if there's gravity, uh, it can only slow down the speed of this thing. It cannot increase the speed. Yet the universe is doing uh, exactly what I just said. It's accelerating for unknown reasons. Um, you can parameterize it as, uh, as some sort of vacuum energy that's responsible for pushing the, uh, the stuff out. But at the moment, we don't really know what's going on. <clears throat> um, so instead of measuring the universe to be somewhere in between this and this, it turns out that the universe is doing this instead. Um, at the moment, uh, I can safely say that we have no clue uh, why the universe is uh, doing this. As far as I know, gravity is not repulsive. Uh, the other repulsive forces that we know are electromagnetic. Maybe the universe is charged, who knows? Maybe GR is wrong, or maybe there's something in the vacuum that, um, <clears throat> that can push the, uh, the stuff outwards. Uh, so supernova, uh, type 1a supernova cosmology was responsible for, uh, for making that um, acceleration. Uh, measurement in uh, the late 1990s. Um, this is uh, what the Hubble diagram that uh, they used. It was, this was a publication uh, a few years after the initial uh, discovery. Uh, but you can see sort of the data sample that, uh, that was used in order to uh, make that measurement. There are, uh, I think, something like 50 or so points here. And uh, statistically, the uh, deviation of these points from zero is significant enough uh, to measure the acceleration. <clears throat> this is the uh, current state. Uh, it was published in 2014, uh, where we combined uh, data from the uh, SDSS, which is uh, what I worked on uh, as a postdoc here. Uh, uh, the Supernova Legacy Survey is a high, higher redshift survey. There are a few points from the Hubble Space Telescope and the low redshift uh, that, um, <clears throat> that are measured by uh, various people. And so we went from here to having uh, several dozens of uh, medium quality points to 740 high quality points in, uh, in just a little over 10 years. Uh, in terms of the cosmology constraints, uh, this is on the uh, mass density, uh, dark energy, uh, density uh, space. Uh, and these are the contours that the supernova data were able to uh, get in the late 1990s. This is uh, what we have right now. The box here represents the, the area here. So you can see that the contours, which were uh, well outside this box 10 years ago, is nicely contained in, uh, in the smaller one. So we made quite a bit of uh, progress. And also uh, what we're trying to figure out right now is what is this thing that's causing the universe to accelerate? Is it a cosmological constant? Is it a constant or is it changing with redshift? This is one of the things that the, uh, the Dark Energy Survey is trying to answer, and of course, LSST and other uh, future uh, surveys. Uh, it's kind of a busy plot, so I won't go into details, but I can tell you more about it if you're interested. <clears throat> uh, so the Dark Energy Survey is, uh, is an ongoing survey. Right now, we are in uh, year two of a five-year uh, operation. Uh, it's designed to use uh, four complementary probes of dark energy weak lensing, uh, barrier ion acoustic oscillations, clusters, and supernovae to try to make the best measurements of the properties of uh, dark energy. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a camera uh, that we built, a 570 megapixel uh, camera with a three square degree uh, field of view called DCAN, which we mounted on the four meter telescope, uh, the Blanco telescope down in Chile. This is where the, uh, the camera goes. Uh, this is a model uh, that uh, was first built at, at Fermilab. Um, <clears throat> we installed it on this telescope in 2012, and uh, we're currently uh, taking data. Uh, it has a, a 25 second-ish uh, slew and readout time. Uh, the filters that we have are GRIZY. GRIZY are the filters that we use. We also have a U-band filter 
uh, which we, uh, is not part of the official dark energy survey, but uh, it's available. Uh, and it's also a community instrument. Whenever we are not using this uh, camera for the dark energy survey, the community observers, they write proposals and get time and use the camera for whatever survey they want to, uh, to uh, carry out. Uh, some pictures. Uh, this is what the focal plane looks like of uh, 62 science CCDs, and I think it has eight more uh, focusing and other CCDs. Uh, it's, you know, 60 centimeters big. It's about this big, uh, filled with 570 uh, megapixels. That's the, uh, is that the shutter or the filter tray, Aaron? Shutter. Yeah, it's a ginormous uh, shutter. One of the corrector lenses. Uh, this is one of the, uh, the filters, um, which, uh, I used to know the, which filter that was, uh, I actually forgot. It's a one monolithic uh, piece of um, <clears throat> uh, crystal and it's a very uniform uh, filter. All, all of the filters that we have are very uh, extremely uniform across the focal plane. <clears throat> uh, the uh, camera was installed in uh, 2012. Uh, in June, uh, I think the, uh, the, the cages and stuff were installed. In July, this is the, the actual camera. Uh, was, I, think it was a, I wasn't there, but a uh, nail-biting moment. Um, $30 million of stuff you know, on this thin uh, cable. Uh, it wasn't dropped. It was installed successfully uh, in August. Here it is. Uh, the CCDs uh, and the camera is there. And in September, it was ready to go. Uh, and this was uh, one of the, uh, the first images. It's the official first light uh, image uh, that we took. Um, and on the first image, we were able to get a 0 0.8 arc second uh, full width half max over the entire uh, field of view. <clears throat> it's a gigantic camera uh, compared to the old one, which is roughly on the, uh, the same scale. Each exposure looks like this. Uh, three square degrees, there's, uh, depending on where you look, there's uh, 50,000 to 100,000 galaxies in one exposure, about 10 galaxy clusters. And whenever you take a, a picture, one picture, there's about 10 active supernovae. Uh, in there. That's, how, many, that's how, how much area we are able to probe in a single shot. Um, so I'm involved in the, uh, the supernova science, uh, which is one of the four complementary uh, probes <coughs> of the, uh, the Dark Energy Survey. Uh, this galaxy here is actually that galaxy. So on September 2012, we took a picture of this, and that galaxy uh, uh, was there. And that's, the, uh, that's this picture uh, blown up. Um, <clears throat> in October, so just a month uh, after we took that picture, there was a supernova that exploded here, a type 1a supernova in November uh, 24th. This is what the uh, picture looked like. So it's pretty much the same, except there's a, a new supernova explosion that we uh, didn't uh, discover. So it was a... Huh. <laughs> Yeah, maybe the scale is slightly different. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and what are these? <laughs> See, so we didn't discover supernovae. <clears throat> All right, so let me tell you a little bit about the, uh, the supernova survey. I'll tell you a little bit more about uh, the non-supernova survey, part of the dark energy survey, but let me start from the, the stuff that, uh, that I actually work on. Uh, so the supernova survey takes uh, an area of about 30 square degrees that corresponds to 10 distinct pointings of uh, DS. Uh, two of the 10 fields are what we call deep fields. We take 10, 20, 30, and an hour integration uh, time in GRIZ per visit. So every time we go to that field, we take a total of uh, close to two hours uh, looking at that same piece of the sky. <clears throat> so that's a very deep. Uh, eight of the 10 fields are shallow. We take approximately uh, about an eighth of an exposure time of the deep field. Okay? Uh, and we visit uh, all 10 of these fields on a mean cadence of about seven days. And uh, this was determined uh, to, to yield very good uh, light curves for us to be able to measure the shape of the light curve, the color of the light curve, uh, and, and so forth, because those are the measurements that give you the, the best uh, distances. They were also designed to, uh, the exposure times were designed to give good I-band and Z-band light curves. These are the reddest uh, filters that we have uh, of a redshift greater than 0.9 type 1a supernovae. 
there aren't that many of these uh, in the uh, literature, maybe a dozen or two uh, that are well measured, and we're trying to make uh, improvements in the area where, uh, where the data are sparse. <clears throat> um, over five years, we expect to find about uh, 3,500 uh, high quality uh, supernova 1A uh, light curves between a redshift range of 0.2 to uh, 1.2 over five years. Now, 3,500 uh, 1As over a five-year uh, interval is, is too many to follow up spectroscopically, especially because the majority of them are, you know, redshift uh, 0.5 to uh, 1. This is the actual redshift distribution of our uh, type 1A supernova candidates. Um, you can't get a spectrum of every single one because it, it's uh, too resource uh, intensive. So what we're going to do instead is to get spectroscopic confirmation of only a subsample of this maybe 10% uh, of this that represents the actual uh, redshift distribution. But for the other ones, we'll, uh, we'll try to get at least a, a host galaxy spectrum of the putative uh, candidate host galaxy so that we at least have the redshift measurements. So that's one of the two uh, critical measurements for measuring the, uh, the expansion history uh, of the universe. <clears throat> um, this is uh, an uh, equatorial um, map and the shaded area corresponds to the area where the, uh, the dark energy survey is getting uh, not so deep pictures. It, it's about 5,000 uh, square degrees. The 10 supernova fields are here, 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 and here. I don't know if you can see the little circles here. There are two circles here, three here, three here, and uh, two over there. So there's 10 total. And these are the areas that we're visiting every seven days uh, and getting very deep uh, images. <coughs> um, Again, the redshift distribution looks like this. It peaks at around uh, 0.5. The majority of these uh, lower redshift uh, type 1As come from the, uh, the shallow fields, and the majority of the higher redshift uh, 1As come from the uh, deep fields. And the reason why we did this is because uh, uh, if you have a wide redshift uh, range, you can use supernovae just from a single telescope, just from this survey, uh, and make a Hubble diagram and do cosmology. It's actually, it doesn't sound so, uh, so important, but it's actually uh, one of the critical things uh, that trying to calibrate uh, different photometric systems to 1% or sub-percent, which is what we're trying to aim, is not very uh, easy. So this was a, a design that we uh, picked. <clears throat> uh, we make sure that, the, uh, that each of these fields are visited on a regular uh, cadence. Uh, the y-axis here shows the, uh, the various fields and the filters. Uh, x-axis is uh, time. Uh, this is, I think, uh, this year's data. Mid uh, we started in mid-August last year, and uh, tonight was actually last night. Um, and we're making sure that each of the fields are covered on a regular cadence, because if we have big gaps in our light curves, the supernova that we find in those uh, areas are not going to be useful. Another um, challenging thing that <clears throat> we had to face is in order to find supernova candidates, you have to do difference imaging. You can't just look at an image and hope to find the new things that were not there uh, last week. There are too many pixels to, uh, to look at. So you have to take an image that you took last night and then subtract a template image that was taken maybe last year or uh, earlier, subtract them out, and look for statistically significant deviations. Um, and it's not an easy thing to do, especially because you have you know, a billion pixels, and you're looking for the hundred or so that have these uh, fluctuations. So there are a billion things that could go wrong. <clears throat> um, we, uh, it's roughly in real time. Uh, we have our data processed in about an hour uh, for the shallow fields and about three hours for the uh, deep fields. Um, that was, this is much better than our requirement, which is uh, 24 hours. Uh, we also have a real-time monitoring system. We, when you have uh, such large amounts of data coming in, you can't look at every single image and say whether the data are good or, uh, good or not just by looking. So what we do is we insert a, a large number of fake supernova in the data stream. So as soon as we get the, uh, the images, we put fake supernova in, thousands of them uh, in the, uh, the actual images, and we analyze them as they are real data. And uh, you can measure the detection efficiency by uh, looking at, okay, which ones were detected, which ones were not, and make plots that look like this. <clears throat> this is um, one of the, uh, the plots from a uh, night in November of uh, two years ago, uh, GRIZ uh, filter. Uh, magnitude uh, is on the uh, x-axis. Uh, 
Uh, and these, these four panels here show you the fake supernova recovery efficiency as a function of the input uh, magnitude. And we do this in real time. We check every night whether these numbers look reasonable. So for this particular uh, night, uh, we were uh, detecting, uh, let's see, so this is the 50% recovery efficiency. So at 23.75 magnitude in Z-band, uh, we were uh, detecting 50% of the fakes that we uh, put in and almost 100% uh, uh, at, uh, at brighter <clears throat> ends. It's never exactly 100% because we, we put them in places where there might be bad pixels, bright stars, and other things. Um, but we look at these numbers and make sure that they are what, uh, close to what we uh, expect. So in a shallow field it, per visit, we go down to about 23.5, 23.7, depending on the uh, conditions. Uh, 24, 24, 24 and a half, a single visit for a shallow field. The D fields, these, these are the one hour exposure, uh, half hour, 20 minutes, and 10 minutes. Uh, we go down to about 24.7 in the Z band um, <clears throat> per visit. On a good night, we've gone down to about 25th uh, magnitude for a 50% uh, efficiency. We, we put them in known galaxies and based on their redshift, we have an input redshift distribution that we try to match that onto the, uh, the galaxies. Yep. But we also put things in blank sky uh, just to measure uh, other things. <clears throat> um, one of the important uh, things that we had to develop was if you blindly take all the statistically significant deviations uh, from a difference image, there are hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, from one night, and that's too many. <clears throat> and uh, we struggled quite a bit at the beginning of the, uh, the survey. Uh, two years ago, we were getting so many detections, we didn't know what to do. We were still finding the things that we put in. So, you know, this curve looked okay, but this was only 5% of, the, of the, uh, the things that were detected. The other 95% of the detections were junk. Um, Artifacts from uh, diffraction spikes of bright stars, bad pixels, slight misregistrations, astrometry is little off, and every source is detected. It was, it was a nightmare. Uh, but a graduate student at, uh, at Berkeley uh, solved this issue. He uh, developed a machine learning uh, algorithm that looks at the, uh, the stamps, uh, little cutouts that we make of every detection, uh, looks at the pixel values, and wrote a machine learning algorithm that says, oh, that's a good one, that's not a good one. Uh, and, uh, Basically, you know, filters out as much junk as he can by looking at the stamps. Uh, and it works remarkably well, and it's, it's also very uh, tunable. Right now, we're getting, uh, when we visit a single supernova uh, field, we're getting about 200 to 500 detections. Almost all of them are real astronomical uh, transients. They're, you know, many of them are variable stars, um, asteroids, things that might not be interesting to a supernova person, but maybe uh, interesting to uh, others, and only about 4% of them are artifacts. We do still have some, you know, misregistrations, uh, poorly subtracted things that we uh, detect, but 4%, we went uh, down from about, uh, you know, 1,000% down to 4% using this uh, machine learning algorithm. <clears throat> and it's uh, tunable. Uh, this is an actual graph of, uh, of the missed detection rate on the x-axis and the false positive rate uh, depending on uh, the machine learning score. So the machine learning algorithm assigns a number between 0 and 1. Uh, 1 is good, 0 is bad. If you pick 0.4, then you have, uh, you're missing about 2.5% of your fakes, uh, but your false positive rate is only 3.5%. So this is the number that we use, uh, and it's, uh, it's working quite well. Do you, do you treat it just as a black box, or do you get some No, he... he Tune the code, you know, try to come up with various parameters for the machine learning. Yeah. It's also, uh, you also need a, a training set. So in the first year, I think you contributed to, uh, to something. We, you know, scanned through a lot of things uh, and tagged good things and bad things and used that as a training set. We actually scanned 500,000 uh, objects in, uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, this code wasn't developed specifically for DS. It was. It was. It was. The algorithm, I think, is pretty generic, but the code itself was built for this. But without something like this, LSST would be a... <laughs> I think, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> so a lot of the issues were, um, 
issues that we didn't have in the Sloan survey, for example, because Sloan had a wide survey first, and they had you know, very good photometric calibration, very good astrometry. Everything was good before the supernova survey started. For DS, the supernova survey started at the same time as the wide survey, so that, you know, every, everything that could go wrong went wrong. <clears throat> um, so this is uh, another, uh, the same picture that I showed on the, uh, the first slide of uh, the Chandra Deep Field uh, South area that uh, consists of three pointings. This is a deep field, and these two are uh, shallow. There are literally 1.5 billion pixels in here. And again, we are trying to find the few hundred or so uh, sources in here out of the uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 9 uh, pixels uh, that are real astronomical uh, transients. Uh, so I'm just going to flip through some uh, images, real images of our supernova data, go into uh, this region, there's a galaxy there, a nice spiral galaxy, uh, a type 1c that we discovered and spectroscopically confirmed at a retro of 0.06. Um, some representative uh, light curves, <coughs> Uh, GRIZ, GRIZ, uh, GRIZ is uh, superimposed on these two plots of a wretch of 0 0.8, 0 0.9, 0 0.9-ish uh, type 1A uh, candidate. Uh, 24th magnitude corresponds to uh, this uh, line over here. We're getting good I-band and Z-band light curves down to about 24th, 24 and a half uh, magnitude. So we're really getting good uh, observer frame I and Z data at wretch of 0.9 and uh, higher. If you go to a lower redshift, 0.35, uh, this is kind of the, the rough quality uh, of the light curves that we're getting. <clears throat> uh, another picture here, this is a high redshift candidate in that tiny area, that little fuzzy galaxy, that dot over here, uh, after subtracting out the galaxy, is there, this is a redshift point, uh, close to redshift one uh, type 1a candidate. <clears throat> Um, so there are some new issues in supernova cosmology that uh, weren't issues uh, before. Um, these two uh, issues are, uh, are primarily because we're finding so many type 1a supernovae, uh, so we can't get a spectroscopic confirmation of every single one of them. If you want to get confirmation of all of the 3,500 type 1a uh, candidates, you need access to two Keck telescopes full time. And that's not something that we have. Maybe Shri does, but um, we don't. Um, so we have to rely on, uh, on, on not getting an active uh, supernova spectrum, but, but instead rely on photometrically classifying the supernovae, uh, maybe with a host galaxy spectroscopic redshift, which we can get after the fact. So we can wait till the supernova fades. Uh, several years later, we can go back and take a, a multi-object spectrograph and get spectra of uh, hundreds of galaxies at a time. <clears throat> Um, this has been done uh, once, or uh, maybe twice, uh, uh, with a Sloan uh, survey, as an example. Uh, this is a paper by uh, Heather Campbell uh, from a couple of years ago, where the, uh, the blue points here show the spectroscopically confirmed type 1a supernovae. This is a Hubble diagram. And the black points are points for which we uh, didn't get a spectrum of the supernovae, but the light curves look like uh, 1a's, but we instead got the, uh, the spectroscopic redshifts of the host galaxies after the fact using the, the fiber system on the, uh, the Sloan telescope. And it seems to work uh, reasonably well. There are outliers here that are probably core collapse. Um, but so it, it, I, I, I think it works, but we haven't really studied the, uh, the biases that might come from, from this uh, classification uh, of the supernova candidates. But there's also this other issue that if you go back and get the galaxy spectrum after the fact, that galaxy, even though it corresponds to the same line of sight, might not have anything to do with the actual supernova candidate. Uh, we calculated uh, this number uh, using, again, the Sloan uh, survey. Um, I happen to be the lead off author of this paper by, you know, it was a graduate student, uh, Ravi Gupta, uh, who did the work. Um, we quantified this, and uh, it turns out that if you want to get an efficiency of about 80% for correctly identifying the galaxy of a supernova candidate, which seems like a reasonable number, you would have about a 5% uh, misidentification. So 5% of the galaxy that we think is a galaxy, it's right where the supernova candidate is, 5% of the time the galaxy has nothing to do with the supernova candidate. <clears throat> um, so these are problems that, uh, that we have to face uh, if you're finding lots and lots of type 1a supernova candidates. Um, the uh, instrument that we're using to get uh, spectroscopic redshifts of the galaxies is uh, the AAT. 
uh, uh, telescope and the A-Omega uh, spectrograph, this uh, is a perfect match for DES because it has a field of view that is almost identical to the DES uh, field of view. So you see that our uh, 62 chips over here and outline uh, in blue is the, uh, the field of view of A omega. And we can put 392 fibers at a time to get spectra of 392 galaxies in one shot. And we're using this to, uh, to get the uh, host galaxy spectra of all of our supernova candidates. Um, we were awarded 100 nights over five years on this telescope, and our goal is to get uh, 200 confirmations. You could still target live uh, uh, transients, um, but uh, more importantly, we're trying to get about 10,000 uh, supernova candidate host redshifts. Um, and uh, we're, we're pretty good, uh, pretty well on track uh, to getting that. <clears throat> um, so since I don't have much time, I won't talk much about the future. Um, but I also wanted to say a few things about other transients that uh, DES uh, finds. So the supernova survey finds uh, all, almost all of the type 1a supernovae, but the data set also has many other kinds of uh, interesting uh, transient events. We are running difference imaging on all uh, 30 square degrees that come every uh, seven days, uh, and we're running uh, difference imaging in real time. Uh, but there's also this 5,000 square degree wide survey in which we are currently not actively looking for transient uh, events. <clears throat> um, the 5,000 square degree wide survey um, has, uh, we, the observing strategy is designed so that in each of the filters, we get 10 visits over a five year uh, uh, duration. Uh, each exposure is 90 seconds, 90 seconds, 90, 90, and 45 seconds uh, in the Y band. Uh, so it's not a well cadenced uh, transient uh, survey, but nevertheless, you st we still do get uh, set, uh, many visits of the same piece of the sky in here. Um, I won't say much about this because we are currently not uh, looking for uh, transient events here, uh, but in the supernova uh, survey data, there are lots of other interesting uh, things that we find. Uh, one of them is, should go back to this, is uh, stuff in our solar system. Um, this is, again, the same plot that I showed earlier that shows our uh, wide survey area. And these blue points here are the known Kuiper Belt and trans-Neptunian objects in our uh, solar system. <clears throat> and they go through our uh, supernova fields every now and then. Uh, there are also new things that we discovered that just happen to uh, pass through our supernova field. Uh, this is uh, uh, an example of one exposure that we took. The dots represent the, uh, the new detections that we found. Uh, to look for solar system objects, you have to look for motion. Motion is not due to the motion of the object, but it's primarily due to the motion of, of uh, the Earth around the sun. <clears throat> uh, nearby things like the main belt asteroids uh, move quickly. These are, I guess, interesting for some people, but not really for us. Uh, in fact, we found uh, uh, many uh, main belt asteroids, about half of them are, were not known, according to the uh, MPC. Uh, but the slowly moving things are the Kuiper Belt object candidates. These are the ones that are close to where Pluto is and maybe uh, farther out. An example of its motion is uh, shown here. This is a hypothetical stationary object. If you put an object at 40 astronomical units and look at that object as a function of the time, it looks like this on the sky. Um, it moves by uh, several degrees on time scales of uh, months. Uh, that corresponds to about a few arc seconds per hour. So if you take a picture a few hours later, that object will no longer be there. <clears throat> uh, and we, in fact, uh, in the supernova data stream, we found a whole bunch of these uh, new trans-Neptunian objects. Uh, there are nine shown here. Uh, you can see the tracks and the dots where we uh, discovered them. Uh, and by measuring the trajectory, you can get the uh, semi-major axis, the uh, um, eccentricity, and other interesting uh, parameters. This is a cool uh, image that uh, Dave Gerdes made of the T known TNOs as a function of time over a five-year duration. You can see some of these go through our supernova fields right here, right here. Looks like a biology uh, thing. <clears throat> yeah, um, tens of AU. 
Okay. Um, I'm out of time. Okay. Uh, supernova and supernova are another thing that we find. I'm sure Shri would say something about that. Tidal disruption events, Fritz uh, uh, talked about this. We also found one uh, recently. Um, uh, like Fritz said, this corresponds to a, uh, a star that just happens to uh, pass by a supermassive black hole. The tidal forces uh, strip the star apart, some of the mass gets accreted, and uh, the accretion generates light, and it makes a characteristic uh, optical uh, signature. Uh, we also got a spectrum of this. It looks like, uh, for this particular candidate that we found, it looks like a normal elliptical galaxy, but superimposed. There's a hot black body, and also possible hints of helium lines uh, in here. Uh, and we're finding uh, a few of these uh, per, per season. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, can you in the future look for the, over the 5,000 square degree uh, fields and look for transients? And is the, those 10 observations, are they uniformly spaced? Uh, they are not uniformly spaced. They are uh, spaced according to their visibility on the sky. So usually what happens is uh, the 10 visits are spread out into a uh, season. So every season we get two visits per filter, and those are typically separated by, you know, a week or so. Um, that might make it more interesting. Uh, possibly, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're not running real-time difference imaging now, but uh, we're trying to do that next season uh, before the beginning of uh, year three in September. Do you fold your completeness estimates into a redshift-dependent extinction prior? Yes, yes. So um, the fake supernovae that we put in have actual light curves in them. Um, of type 1As and core collapse. Including host galaxy extinction? Yes, cool. yeah, <clears throat> and stretch distribution and, and realistic distribution. So we're able to do that. Another question about the three-phase observation procedure. Yeah. So, um, you said that you would pick a subset and target those with spectros uh, to target those with spectroscopic, spectroscopic follow-up. Is that just a random subset, or do you do something like um, Take the photos out of the galaxy nearby. Uh, yep. So is it completely random, or, or, or it's, it's not completely scary? random. We're trying to uh, to do follow up of a uh, redshift distribution that looks like the actual redshift distribution, but uh, maybe a factor of ten uh, lower. So we use information like the host galaxy photo Z's and uh, other things. We also try to target things that are ambiguous. It kind of looks like a one A, but not because those are the the contaminants when we try to do cosmology. Do yep. you have an estimated mass distribution for the trans-Neptunian objects you found? Mass, uh, well, in size. Place, yeah, size. we have Depends. size, size estimates. albedo and stuff. Yeah, yeah hundreds, hundreds of kilometers, uh, assuming you know a five percent albedo, uh, but they're they're not good estimates. They're you know back of the envelope estimates. Yeah. Okay, let's thank myself again.
Is this on? Can people hear me? Oh, good. It's on. OK, um, so I'd like to talk uh, today about transients. Uh, by some accounts, uh, this is uh, the next 10 years, uh, this will be a, a, a growth field um, and uh, perhaps something that uh, uh, would be very, very popular. Uh, so I thought uh, uh, of uh, paying some tribute to perhaps, I would say, a less recognized pioneer in this field, uh, Fritz Wicke, who in my opinion is uh, uh, Pasadena's greatest astronomer. Uh, the others are factors of 10 or 100 below him. Uh, they may be even better known, but uh, they are nowhere as smart as him. Uh, he was an amazing person. He was a theorist, experimentalist, an observer. You see he's there observing by himself, reducing the plates, and writing a paper. I doubt if I was any single professor in this room who had that distinction of doing a single author paper from observations to data reduction. Um, he was an inventor. He held fundamental patents in jet propulsion, a major contributor to the US war effort, a philosopher, as uh, well known to people in department philosophy, uh, and uh, just brilliant, that's all. And he started basically what I'd consider as a modern field of time, time domain astronomy. A hundred years ago when, uh, at that time, Harvard astronomy was the leading edge. I'm talking about hundred years ago, mind you. It was the leading edge astronomy department. And they do variable stars. But they're not controlled experiments. They're just a thing. You take plates and look for stars which vary because you don't need a sense of control when you're looking for variable stars which repeat. So um, Zwicky got the idea when he heard of the invention from Bade of a wide field telescope, uh, the, so what we now call the Schmidt design, which combined large aperture as well as a wide field. And uh, Bade and he began the uh, a survey looking for <coughs> basically things that go boom in the sky, but in a controlled manner. And uh, so this is an aerial view of the Palomo Observatory. And uh, um, this is the first telescope that came up in 1936. And that was the very first Schmidt telescope in the world with the, with the glass ground by, the corrector ground by Bernard Schmidt himself that Bade got for, or Oswicki got from, from him in Germany. Um, the other telescopes came up later. The 200 inch, the big one in night, first light 49, the 48-inch Schmidt, which because it became so successful, came up in 51, and this is a student telescope built early 70s. The biggest uh, result from the Bade, Schmidt, uh, Bade and uh, Zwicky's work was um, the distinction between novae and supernovae. Uh, this concept of phase space to understand observational phenomena, we use that word routinely, but actually this is due to Zwicky. He didn't use the word phase space, called morphological analysis. So even though he may not have plotted this, well, I'll just call it as a Zwicky diagram in his honor, where I plot the uh, peak magnitude or luminosity on one axis and the duration of the phenomena. We'll not, at this stage, let's not worry whether it's the rise time or the decay time or, the du or plateau time. It's just a duration. And you can see very clearly the, that novae, which are all then called novae, are clearly different from supernovae. In many ways, supernovae of type 1 are the simplest explosion, so I use that as an as a, a indicator of supernovae. So this factor of 10 to the 4 difference is what led them to come up with the word super-nova, except it's not so common, like many words which are made up, you, you forget the dash, and it's not a regular word in the English language. OK, so that's sort of a little bit of a history. Uh, and. Uh, so there are some interesting areas in astrophysics that I would say where the action really is not the distant universe. Uh, it's, uh, it's in fact the closest universe. So I was actually somewhat astonished at the statement that cosmology and transients were similar to someone. Uh, to me, they couldn't be more dissimilar. Um, and uh, the, uh, so let me tell you where the rest of the universe doesn't matter at all. First one is ultra energy cosmic rays. We now know, thanks to the uh, high energy observatories such as the OJ Observatory, 
that, the, that nature produces these amazing cosmic rays, 10 to the 20 in electron volts, which may not mean much, except you ask, what is the fastest ball ever thrown by anyone? And you do half mv square, and, that's a, and convert to ev, that's about 10 to the 21 ev. Except this is in one particle, not in few ounces of material. Okay, <clears throat> so when these particles traverse from wherever they are to you, they see a bath of thermal background from CMB, which is 400 photons per centimeter cube, each about one milli electron volt. The inverse Compton scattering is so large at this point that in fact new channels of particle production open up, open up such as pions, and therefore this cosmic ray in fact can't propagate much, and this is the GZK radius. So for these particles, redshift of 10 universe matters zero. In fact, the only part of the universe you know this comes from is 50 to maybe 100 megaparsecs. Similarly, you have the same thing for very high energy neutrinos. Any very high energy particle will suffer its own equivalent to a GZK effect as long as particle production channels open up. Another frontier field is gravitational wave astronomy. And here, we have a theoretical simulation, black hole, neutron star, neutral star being shredded as it's for radius gravitational waves away, then falls onto the black hole, perhaps generating uh, beams uh, of particles and radiation, short, hard gamma ray burst. And the goal is of physicists to find this with uh, LIGO and Virgo detectors. Gravitational waves don't suffer from optical depth. Uh, they can go through the whole universe. But the sensitivity of these instruments is such that what really matters is the nearest 100 megaparsecs into this decade anyway. So these two are frontier fields where we actually know very little. These are the most amazing phenomena if you just step back and try to digest what all this stuff means. And yet what matters is the nearest part of the universe, not far away. So uh, about 2007, uh, had this idea of, instead of trying to do these surveys that many people do, and saying this survey will do everything for everyone, uh, which by the way is completely false. Uh, you can say that, but it's not at all true. When you do a survey, it's like an experiment. You have to choose some numbers, cadences, duration, sensitivity. You can't say I will do everything for everyone. That's sort of a political statement, and you may do that to sell a project. But uh, the whole idea of the Palomar Transient Factor is to do a real experiment to probe the nearby universe. Okay, so it's a system, it doesn't do anything else for you. It doesn't do cosmology, it doesn't do stars, it doesn't do uh, uh, deep imaging, catalogs, nothing. It, it does one thing, and that's transients. Okay, so the slight novelty of that idea was there are many surveys. In fact, the world is awash with transients, in my opinion. It's easy to find supernovae, okay, uh, or supernovae candidates. What is not easy is to actually then say which one you want to pursue and why, and then write a great paper, okay. So the, the idea of the Palomar transient factory is it was chosen with a, a purpose. A factory is where you go to a Toyota factory, you have a fender section, a steering wheel section, and the robotic things that are assembling this and cost speeding out at a high rate. So the idea is, Stop this by hand searches and come up with a machine that will generate supernovae in the nearby universe maybe every few hours. Okay, <clears throat> so the 48 inch was deployed to do only one band survey. So unlike Sloan or Pan Stars, we don't do five bands. It's a deliberate choice. And the choice is because it gives you a factor of five speed up. Okay, it, all it does is survey, it's a, it's a, it's a discovery machine do the analysis in real time, and find the candidates, use 60 inch for color confirmation and validation. You need to validate this is real, and the color tells you sometimes a bit of what it is. It looks very interesting to the 200 inch. Okay, so this is sort of an integrated approach which allows you to go from detection to discovery. So when people say they found a super, they discovered a supernova, you, you have to be very careful with that word. Discovery is not seeing. Discovery is actually understanding what you saw. And there's a lot of steps between seeing and understanding. And for that, you need an end-to-end -end solution. Merely doing a large photometric survey uh, is not all that interesting for transients. Okay, the hardware, it's an old CFH-12K 
that some of you may have used. It was refurbished. And uh, <coughs> these are the numbers for the astronomers in the audience. And uh, so we started the program in about 2009. And one of the things that uh, may not be so obvious to you is that uh, this is a low budget operation. So one of the things we decided is everything is robotic. There is no one running the system at all at any given time. It's completely robotic, including sequencing, which is actually much harder than most of you can understand. Sequencing here is how do you decide what this telescope should do? Okay, the usual approach is, oh, I have a robotic telescope, which means at four in the afternoon you sit down and you say, let's go to position A, if it's filter this, exposure that. You can do this for a few days, you can hand it to a student, initially the student here, she will be excited, they're running a telescope. Likely four months later, they'll come with a, whatever, let's say, AK-47 or something and shoot it because it's an incredibly boring job to do that. Okay, and I didn't want to suffer that, especially at Stanford. I remember when I was a student here, there's some grad student with the hammer business. It always worries me when I come here. But anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, it's all robotic. And uh, so we, uh, all these young people contributed to this. One of the things which uh, we already implemented in 2009 was machine learning in, in astronomy. So we don't have people actually staring at these images. In fact, we are at RB4 version 4. So we, in fact, have a group of people now at Los Alamos, JPL, Berkeley, where we keep testing new levels of machine learning to improve, to improve our ROR characteristics. Josh Bloom led that when he was young, and with all the knowledge he acquired, he's now buggered off to form his own machine learning company somewhere in Bay Area. Um, and Jason led the pipeline for photometry. Peter Nugent, I think he's the world's greatest image differencing expert, and uh, he leads that. Uh, Ron Ofek, all those are young postdocs when they came. Ron Ofek had just finished his PhD from, from Tel Aviv. He led the sequencing, okay. Uh, uh, then Richard DeKenny was the hardware, and then uh, Quimby had finished his PhD at Texas, and he was in charge of software integration. Um, and Nick Law had finished his PhD from Cambridge, UK. He was a project scientist. So uh, my management field also is very simple. First, don't deal with idiots, hire good people and then give them a time, money, and then see them a year later, that's it. And it works very well because we went from concept to first light in 26 months, okay? And that's the proof this works. Okay, and then we had a little workshop to invite a few theories, so we had a little sort of a appearance of some scholarship and so on. Okay, um, so as a, this is a giant software project, and uh, the idea is simple, but there are a lot of complications. The complexity here is we need to turn this around in half hour. And it's whether it's half hour, 30, or three minutes, doesn't matter. Half hour is a big number here, because we don't do anything in three minutes right now. So there's a lots of these pipelines running between Berkeley, uh, DOE, uh, uh, NERSC here in Oakland, IPAC, Berkeley uh, campus for the machine learning stuff. And uh, um, the upshot is, there's no one attending this. Uh, our pipelines are so wonderful that they entirely they recover on their own. In fact, we have never had a downtime for any failure of pipelines, which is actually quite amazing. Okay, so I'll skip all the, the technical details um, and just summarize a few things, which is uh, the, an explosion of explosions. We have now something like 2,500 supernovae that means that's the number of supernovae we have which are characterized. We have a spectrum, we know what it is. We probably have about 7,500 detections of candidates. It's not as interesting. And of those 2,500, you know, we are doing the usual stuff. There's demography, there's 1A cosmology, all that sort of stuff. Uh, that, uh, but let me just focus on the fun part, okay? <clears throat> is, is the 3% that don't fit in into the regular categories. So this is one A thermonuclear explosions, these are core collapse explosions with hydrogen, without hydrogen, and there are a few percent which don't uh, add up to any of these categories, and that's the reason we build discovery machines like this. Okay, so let's go back to the Zwicky diagram. Remind you, peak luminosity versus time scale. I have a graph, a diagrammatically, I have a classical movie, the one A thermonuclear supernovae, core collapse, this is roughly where they stick around, and you can see we are slowly filling up. 
Okay, by the way, this is a usual test I do uh, to figure out someone is a physicist or astronomer. Is you show them a figure like this, and the physicist is always trying to figure out what is the one parameter which explains this family and so on. The astronomer looks and says, what is it I can go, do to go and discover the white space is not white? Okay, so immediately now you know who you are. Okay, anyway, the white space is not white. There's stuff all over. There are two types of luminous red movie. This group, in fact, occurs only in bulges. And I think, in fact, these are all common on the onset of common envelope. Common envelope is a very important stellar phenomena, without which you won't get fine systems like millisecond pulsars or LMXBs. These, we believe, are electron capture supernovae, which happen on spy lines. Some supernovae which go incomplete thermonuclear burning. They produce perhaps most of the calcium in the universe is produced by this group. And then there's this whole group of superlumen supernovae where PTF did a fair bit of significant contribution. Okay, so um, we did this for a while, uh, first two years, which is what we call as a classical search, where you come back every five days. It is a deliberate program. The idea is to get a huge throughput of supernovae in a year. So our, at peak, we are classifying 700 supernovae a year. And that allowed us to explore the phase space. But after that, once we crossed 1,000 supernovae, I said, you know, it's not very interesting. Once you do 1,000, we can do 2,000, but likely you're not going to be writing great papers at that time. So we decided at that point we had enough technology that we'd go for low, low latency. So latency is the time difference between the photon hitting the CCD and you, the astronomer, knowing what it, what it really means, because that may trigger subsequent follow-up action. So uh, we spent a year uh, kaizening our way through. It's a Japanese automotive uh, concept where you make gradual improvements every week. At the end of the year, we actually made huge improvement, which is exactly the opposite of uh, order of magnitude improvement, which would have been the philosophy for American car companies. Um, anyway, so uh, after kaizening our way through for a year, we are lucky because in August 2011, we discovered PTF 11 KLY. In uh, Messier 101, the Pinwheel Galaxy, only eight megaparsecs away, found less than 10 hours after it exploded. Okay, and we knew it is a 1A. It's not just saying we found some few photons and we're claiming this was characterized 10 hours after it exploded. That requires an incredible machinery to actually work, not just the software, but the whole follow-up and so on. Okay, uh, and because it, we caught it so early and nearby, you could look at Hubble, you could look at Chandra, we had all those observations, and we could in fact say that the circumstellar medium around this object was very, very rarefied, which is in accord with the idea that these white dwarf, the progenitor for this is a pair of white dwarfs, a very old system that's radiating very gravitational waves, and eventually one day coalesces, explodes. In contrast, if you have a mass transferring donor, which is another channel where you have a white dwarf, a donor, which is transferring matter, like an LMX being the neutron star world, is transferring matter. Eventually, the white dwarf grows over the Chandrasekhar limit and explodes. That's called the single degenerate channel. So this one is generally taken to be one of the best circumstantial evidence for the so-called double degenerate channel. Um, you know, another thing in astronomy, the physics and the astronomy difference is the following. Many times, even astronomers make this mistake. When you find something, you set up a, a straw man. So, in the 1A world, there are some people who believe in single degenerate and some people who believe in double degenerate. The papers all the time, 1As are from DD, 1As from SD. The fact is, if you're a very smart person, never go that way. Because in astronomy, whatever is not forbidden by basic physics actually happens. So the only thing here is you just don't know the ch branching ratio. Both channels are active and you don't know whether it's 1% 99 or 99.1 or 50-50. Okay, so if you're an astronomer, you should always be on the lookout for all possibilities. And the key is to understand those numbers. As an example, so we wrote this paper. We've got two nature papers, one on the progenitor, the other on the circumstellar medium. That's good, you know, one discovery, two papers, not bad at all. And here's another one we're just uh, dealing with nature now. And this one, PIPTA1480G, we are seeing very strong, it's a complex diagram, but we're very seeing strong UV emission found with the Swift Observatory. And this one, in fact, is best interpreted as the one, the so-called single degenerate channel. So what's happening in this one is the 1A explodes, the blast wave hits up after transfer, traversing the orbital radius, 
the companion, and in the reverse shock of the ejector, you get very strong UV emission. Okay, so I will tell you already, the benching ratio, if you want, 0.7 and 0.3. Okay, this is based on two numbers, but then we can spend a lot of time, do Bayesian stuff, it's not worth it. This is roughly the answer. Okay, so after doing that for a year and a half of, you know, same night, kind of one, what we call as one night stands, we said, okay, let's go and do what is I thought we'll never be able to do, at least I thought I was surprised that we'd do it so, fit, so quickly, is the needle in the haystack problem. So one of the biggest challenges for gravitational wave astronomy is that the initial interferometers are very modest. You have a small baseline just from the continental baseline in the US. All said and done, it's a one baseline interferometer. The resolution is simply the gravitational wave length divided by 3,000 kilometers. There's only so much blood you can squeeze out of that poor baseline, and that's why those air circles will be very large, hundreds of square degrees. Even if you add Virgo, it will be many tens of square degrees. And therefore, the question is, you get a LIGO trigger, can you go and find out within the same night if there's an electromagnetic counterpart, but in a few hundred square degrees? And one more distinction between physicists and astronomers is the following. Most physicists will say, oh, what is the rate of these things, how bright it is? Wrong question, wrong answer. The real thing you should ask is, what else will I get confused by? Okay, because the sky is much richer than most of us can imagine. And it turns out the false positives completely overwhelm any known signal. And that's the reason we build PTF, is in fact to have a, a real handle on false positives. Okay, so I thought we'll never do this problem, because the number of false positives in one night in 100 square degrees is so large, but fortunately we had an amazingly brilliant student, Leo Singer, who's now gone on to Goddard as a postdoc, and he was able to solve this, and I was surprised. Um, so we decided to start with a known problem, um, and I hate to continue this analogy. Another difference in physicists and astronomers is physicists do a lot of simulation before they do the experiment. Astronomers do the experiments. Okay, so we decided we'll use GBM localization as an experiment. GBM localizes to about 100 square degrees. We said, okay, if you can't find this, we're screwed anyway. So we use the GBM as localization, and in fact, we're able to demonstrate, in this particular case, we had an IPN arc, we're able to recover the afterglow. Okay, but it, I'll tell you, it, it gets even better. We, in fact, now are doing untriggered GRBs. That is, we actually are discovering GRBs on our own merit without a triggering from any high energy detector. Okay, and this one we know because after we found, we talked to Kevin Hurley, and it turned out one of the Russian missions, which had not transmitted the data, actually had seen this in the, in the time interval where we said we had actually found the afterglow. Okay, so in order to do these things, it's not, uh, you really need not only all these rapid and reliable software things, you also need a little organization. And uh, for us it's simple, because my philosophy has been, the more people are having a collaboration, less likely to be efficient. So our collaboration is the smallest number we can. Um, so here it is. So we get this, uh, this is all in UT, here's what's happening. Get the trigger, we have an email sniffer that figures out. Sun sets, so not much we can do. Our software kicks in, does this. All the machine learning stuff eliminates all this huge number of candidates down to seven. Then uh, we inspect that, that's only time the humans wake up because it's important enough. Sun rose in California, and then we knew what it was because uh, we had Swift, and uh, Neil Gels has been amazingly cooperative. We can almost trigger Swift from our uh, own offices at this point. And uh, then one of them showed a decline, then we got a spectrum from, uh, from uh, Magellan, and got the redshift, all done. Okay, and paper was submitted in two weeks later. Okay. So, um, so here it is. There's a new part of phase space that we're now filling. Um, <coughs> the, uh, so the, the next part is, you know, how do we automate the discovery itself? Because I've been very fa always fascinated by automation. So, uh, and that leads me to the main part of the talk in some sense, which is <coughs> automating the discovery of the universe. Okay, so. It took me a while, but the best way to do astronomy, in my opinion, is to get the astronomers out of the dome, okay? 
uh, because they, are, they slow down the discovery. So uh, that's what ZT is all about. We have, uh, as usual, for uh, uh, money, we have accumulated a large number of partners. And ZTF is the automated discovery of the universe with as few humans in the loop as possible. Um, our main phase space is here, this less than a day. We already are actually filling in here, which I thought two years ago we wouldn't be doing. And uh, this requires high cadence, but high cadence also requires either the aerial coverage goes down or it comes with a larger field of view, which we are now doing. So we're building a camera, which is 16 of these massive E2 monolithic chips. And here's the old camera, old uh, detector array. Here's the new one, 47 square degrees. It fills the entire Schmidt plate that so those of you have seen those, it looks slightly larger, in fact. Okay, uh, all of our engineering has been done. We have about 10 CCDs in hand, another few months, we'll get all of them, and uh, we're testing the, characterizing them now, and uh, we hope to be on air in 2017. So I have to, I have to be very careful, uh, let me be very specific here. If you want to make these sorts of time domain discoveries, going fainter without cause, is not necessarily better, okay? Uh, because uh, you can go fainter, you'll just find lots of more old uh, 1A supernovae. It's not terribly interesting, for example. Or you may find something that you don't understand, because in the discovery game, if you don't understand what it means, it's a wasted transient. So you really should have a fine tuning between the ability to follow up or digest what you see, or you'll just be generating events. Okay, which are of no, not huge value. So we have des described what we call as a spectroscopically accessible transients. So when you're doing new things, you need spectroscopy. When you have something which you understand, our library, you don't need spectroscopy. The time series alone eventually will tell you what it is. So here's the, so instead of using the usual at one do, which is what everyone says, my thing is bigger than yours sort of stuff, what we have is that this is how much of that we can actually digest with the resources we have. And um, that's what uh, ZTF can do. It has the largest amount of spectroscopically available uh, volume. Um, and uh, therefore, I think when we start in 2017, um, it should be very interesting. It's not enough to just say, oh, I'll go find stuff. This old style of doing astronomy, you find something, call up a buddy, and then you get some observing. We can't afford that. When you have such large rates, when your whole clock has changed from, you know, let's get it next week to the next hour, you need reliable and guaranteed services, and therefore it has to be robotic. That's what I'm saying. Put the astronomers in, then you have to argue with this person why he or she should give up their observing time. And I've been there so many times, it's very painful, and so on. So our approach is to, in fact, simply take over telescopes and start having them to follow. So one of the things we have is a, the SED machine. It's a deliberately designed uh, integral field unit spectrograph for classification. So the, this is the entrance of the IFU. It's got a fixed filter, somewhat inspired by SNFs, as you can see. And this on the robotic 16-inch telescope. So here it is very simple. Machines find things. We do our probabilistic ranking. The telescope slews. We get a spectrum. Machine classification 1A, then I'll say exit out. Not 1A, I may get interested. Okay, uh, so this is a joke for you. Okay, and then we have uh, a light curve. Here's a robo AO. And what this is, um, is uh, it's a robotic AO system. It's a roller scattering AO system. It uses UV, so we don't need any FA approval at this point. Uh, we can do a few hundred targets a night. It's been fantastic. Right now, we've been doing one of the largest multiplicity surveys. But it also means that we can just command this telescope and say, is this transient found close to the center of a galaxy truly nuclear or a slightly offset supernova, as an example? And that's a confusing signal, depending whether you like supernovae or TDEs. Okay. Um, Yeah, this is a, we're not aiming for high stall ratio. It's about 20%, you know, in, in uh, I band, that's good enough. It's a one and a half meter telescope. Okay, so the dynamic ultraviolet, and there's, uh, there's new stuff coming along here. Uh, maybe with some luck, the SRG mission will happen. I was at 
Iki last uh, in June, I, I thought this was actually a very fun little uh, graph I made for Rashid. Uh, the Russians didn't seem to find it as funny as I thought it was. Uh, anyway, so this is the, the, as you know, the sky is divided, uh, Russia and Germany, and this is the part above the red line is what we can see. Okay. Um, and uh, we have a movie of the sky at this point. We have years of data, so we can actually go and uh, uh, start looking, because one of the big things that uh, SRG will do, so it's not playing. Anyway, this is a uh, you know, time-lapse uh, coverage of the sky, which is quite extensive. And uh, one of the things that became very clear in the last few years, the synergism between PTF and SWIFT has been so phenomenal, because we had written maybe over eight nature papers, so that's a simple way of counting phenomenal. And uh, so I've uh, gotten into interest in, uh, in uh, why not just do a UV uh, sky survey? So this is a program we've been developing with, uh, uh, with Weizmann Institute in Israel and the Israeli Space Agency submitted for one of these mission of opportunity. And this is about 220 square degrees of UV using delta dope CCDs. So it has as much sensitivity as Galax, but a field of view which is 220 times, because we're using not image tubes, but modern CCDs. Okay, there's the new grayware, what I call as grayware. Uh, get small number of smart people, and uh, they all do all these very interesting things, and they're getting ready. Here's a schedule for ZTF. And uh, we hope, in fact, it will start in 2017.5, not first light. Uh, first light will be 2017. This is the start of the survey. And then maybe with some luck, if the Ultrasat mission is approved, then we'll have this joint ZTF Ultrasat program. OK, in the last three minutes, I want to help Steve get ready for LSST. <laughs> Steve, I've known Steve for a long time, since Berkeley days. And Steve is always the physicist as, as the astronomer, which is perhaps you might have sensed there's some pattern to those jokes. Uh, but the strange thing is that Alma becomes a physicist, and he may not realize this, but director of LSST, which is a facility, he is now becoming an astronomer because Steve can no longer control. The difference between an experiment and a facility is an experiment, you figure out something clever, and next day you do it. Facility, you just have a board meeting, and you do nothing anyway. So, <laughs> So Steve will now be contending with all the users. They'll want to say, I want my cadence, I want my cadence. And they'll come up with some god-awful thing called universal cadence, which means everyone in the room is universally equally unhappy. That's, that's what universal cadence is. Anyway, Steve will be stuck with that, but I'm his friend. I feel a little bad for him now, so I want to help him. I want him to get something out of LSST other than grief. OK, so you know, back, back of my house, there's an orange tree. And oranges are nice. And uh, physicists might say, oh, yes, nice. Let's get some oranges. What you don't understand is in ordinary life, before you reach the orange tree, the miles and miles of lemons you have to go through. OK? And uh, so, this is a, so the thing is, I want to help Steve train to be understanding how to get rid of lemons so that a couple of years from now, you can do this, what I do in the morning. When I get up, I go pluck an orange, squeeze it, and start my day. I want you to have that with LSST. Let me end that with one example. After I wrote the Ultrasat proposal, December 18th, I still remember, MOO, it was like a long slog. I slept for a day, and then I got bored. Then I told my gang, hey, I've been out of this whole game for a while in PTF. I've been doing other things. Uh, is there something interesting? They said, yeah, there are a bunch of long duration trends, and we don't know what's going on. So I sat down and thought deeply and looked at the data, did some MATLAB programming and all the good stuff that Steve's no longer doing. And uh, I figured out something interesting. So I studied this object. It's called PTF 14 AON. It's bright. It uh, coincides with an elliptical galaxy. And I figured out that this mysterious object was, in fact, one, the brightest TDE to date, which is why people are puzzled. And the usual stuff ran around. You know, there's all this CAC data we had. It's beautiful. It's a power law spectrum here with IGM absorption. I'll skip all those details, other than tell you that this is the sort of stuff I used to be doing in GRBs, but in the middle of the night, here a month later, you can go and get a spectrum. To me, it's like a novel experience. Anyway, here it is. You can get uh, IGM, and you can do all sorts of fun things. So this is a TDE, a tidal disruption event. And uh, so what's happening here, this is a black hole. Uh, it's a blue dot here. The star comes by. This is a simulation from the Santa Cruz Theory Group. 
And uh, it's a rather complex uh, process here, which I won't go in, in great detail, except in the beginning, there'll be a lot of matter raining down in this nuclear black hole. But eventually, it ceases. So you get to a point when m dot actually decreases. So simple thinking will tell you at some point the m dot becomes low, or we're using the words of stellar binaries, which I know a bit about, you get into the low heart state. So I was wondering, when does it get into low heart state? And here it is. Um, here's the uh, UV light coming down. X-rays have started just emerging just a few weeks ago. Okay, so uh, since I have two directors here, uh, Chandra and uh, Nusta, I'll soon put a little proposal tonight maybe, and we'll figure out. We'll figure out if this is a hard X-ray source, which is what my prediction is. And then uh, under- And everybody else just gets on hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Ah, that's a proposal to the VLA for DD. Yeah. So if we take the fundamental plane of that relation, however flawed it is, we expect about 20 microjansky at S band. Neil. <coughs> Neil. How much time do you get on the 200 inch? Are you going to be able to keep getting that? Uh, probably not. Uh, right now, you know, well, there's Tom Prince interest in this Mansi, so we probably can do maybe three, four nights a month, um, similar number of nights at Keck. So yeah, you have to therefore up your game. So we are now for the TDEs. One of the things we is we are now developing filters based on this knowledge. So to understand in this game, it's not what you want; it's stuff that you have to reject. So for TDEs, you have to reject very low-level AGN. You have to also reject uh, off-center uh, supernovae. And uh, so with the knowledge you gain, you set up these filters that become better and better. Uh, the idea that you have to pursue every transient, I think it's uh, unnecessary. You know, it does, there's no compulsion on part of astronomers to study every supernovae. Every second in the universe, there's a supernova exploding. Do we all really care about that? No, so we have to care about things that we can digest. So this, uh, I find the discussion of this follow-up to be uh, at two extremes. There's one hand, the sum of strong saying, oh my God, we are, don't know what to do with follow-up. Uh, the other ones will say, we don't, we are not, you know, we'll only do some boring log and log S surveys and therefore we don't need to follow up. I, so the somewhere in between is the right answer. <coughs> Especially, you um, you showed a lot of type two has different category like super luminous or relativistic. So, can you summarize what basic things you understand more about supernovae? What do we understand more? Right, basic physics. I, 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 I've been a bit in this uh, end state of stars for a while. Ten years ago, I understood far more than today. Okay, um, the this. I think we only understand how stars up to maybe 20 solar masses explode. After that, I think it is very complex now. It, it really is a much, much more harder game. So I'm sorry, I can't give a simple answer because I could argue that some supernovae which die by pair instability, some by pulsational instability, some have some massive eta carina like things which somehow seems to be triggered with their death as though they have a death hormone. None of these actually, uh, actually the simplest is pair instability. I think that is a nice homework problem. After that, this is all very hard stuff. And whether they produce black holes, spinning, not spinning, unknown. Is magnetas important in some supernovae, as some people would argue, unknown. So I think it will be interesting. We have that phase where basically the number of theoretical ideas sort of are larger than the number of observations. So um, it'll, this will be an you know, interesting many few years to come now. <coughs> 